Howdy. We're going to keep talking about uh, terms related to grain boundaries here. Um, and these are things uh, that um, could, uh, could happen at homophase interfaces. So again, I have the same phase on either side uh, of the interface. So that could mean a crystal of iron and another crystal of iron. It could mean a crystal of silicon and another crystal of silicon. But um, I want to talk about this interface between the two. Um, and the terms we're going to use now are for things where there's some sort of a change in the lattice uh, orientation across uh, that interface. Um, and so the most general case is called an asymmetric grain boundary. Um, and that's just where the, the rotation on one side uh, is, is um, sort of arbitrarily relative to the rotation on the other side. They don't, have, they don't meet, necessarily meet any special conditions. Um, so this is a general grain boundary, um, and, and it's an asymmetric grain boundary. Uh, so what, what do we need in order to describe a general grain boundary? Well, I need um, two parameters to describe the rotation uh, of uh, lattice uh, on one side of the, of the boundary with respect to the lattice on the other side of the boundary. Um, and so these are essentially our, our, oops, uh, our Euler rotation angles. Um, and uh, again, all I've talked about now is how is the lattice oriented relative to um, the lattice on the other side. So we haven't said anything about the nature of the interface yet. So in addition, I would need uh, some parameters which describe the orientation of that interface. So uh, again, let's assume I have this uh, orientation on one side of the grain boundary, this on the other side, but my grain boundary could be oriented in a bunch of different directions. So these are two examples of potential grain boundaries. And what we can do is we can use three parameters to describe the normal to the grain boundary surface. Um, and so one example uh, might be this one up here, or a different example might be this other grain boundary normal. Um, but these are, again, these are uh, parameters I would need to describe the orientation of the, the interface itself. And finally, Depending on uh, how the crystal lattice looks on either side, there might be a rigid body translation. And so I might need to take uh, you know, uh, the, the, the unit cell and the, the lattice on the left-hand side and just shift it over a little bit with respect to the lattice on the left-hand side. Um, and so we could use additional parameters to describe uh, that rigid body translation on one side with respect to the other side. And so this is especially important uh, in um, things like ceramic materials where we care about the, uh, the lattice terminations. Um, and so the termination, like the actual exposed atoms on the end of uh, the crystal at this interface, could be different based on this rigid body translation. So that was the most general case. But in addition, we can kind of break it down into more specialized cases. Um, and so one thing we could think about is a tilt grain boundary. Um, and that's a grain boundary where the rotation of the lattice on one side with respect to the other um, is only rotated um, around uh, one particular axis. And that axis is lying sort of in this plane coming, uh, coming out towards you, uh, coming out of your screen. Um, and so as an example, here's, a, here's an orientation on the left and or orientation on the right. Um, in a symmetric tilt grain boundary, each of those have been rotated some angle theta in equal and opposite uh, directions. Um, in, a, in an asymmetric tilt grain boundary, um, they've both been rotated some angle, but that angle is different. Maybe this is theta and this is theta prime. But again, I've, the, only thing, the only way I've changed the lattice on the right relative to the lattice on the left is by rotating it around some particular vector that in this case is projecting out of the board. And that's what makes this a tilt grain boundary. So you can kind of picture the whole uh, universe of rotations um, of one lattice with respect to the other, and I'm restricting that to only rotating around one axis that is lying in the plane of the interface, and it's kind of projecting out the board towards us. Um, and this is a TEM image of a symmetric tilt grain boundary. Um, and so the grain boundary itself is here. And, it, and I can identify um, you know, the uh, set of lattice vectors on one side uh, and a set of lattice vectors uh, on the other side. And what I can see is that they 
both been rotated uh, some angle where that angle is equal and opposite. Um, and so that's what make this a tilt grain boundary. Um, so let's look at something like this. Um, is this a symmetric or an asymmetric uh, uh, tilt grain boundary? Um, so the first thing you want to do is identify where is the interface. And so in this case, the interface is uh, lying along a plane here. And if I draw um, a set of lattice parameters, uh, then I can pretty quickly see um, that these two things have, have both been uh, rotated um, some angle uh, relative uh, to the plane. Uh, and, and it's an equal and opposite angle. So, you know, one way I could, I could measure that is this angle here is equal uh, and opposite to this angle here. So this is an example of a symmetric tilt grain boundary. Okay, so the next term we're going to use is a low angle boundary, um, and this happens to be a low angle tilt grain boundary, but we could, we could have other kinds of low angle boundaries. Um, and, and low angle really just means that, that that angle of opening, you know, if this is the boundary itself, um, the angle between the orientation on the right hand side and the orientation on the left hand side is small. So this theta angle uh, where this is uh, theta in equal opposite sense is, is a very small number. Um, and, and tilt grain boundary, or sorry, low, low angle grain boundaries are special um, for a couple reasons. So they generally have a very low energy associated with them. Um, and you can kind of see why that is because there's a, there's a large portion uh, of the interface that doesn't really seem that perturbed at all. Um, and in fact, uh, they're kind of special because we can describe a low angle tilt grain boundary um, as an array of evenly spaced dislocations. And what you can start to see is that the larger the angle gets, the more dislocations I would need to accommodate that low angle tilt. Um, so the image on our right, the angle is very small. The image on the left, the angle is, the angle is, is somewhat larger. So again, uh, this is the angle that I'm talking about. So that's theta, uh, but this is also theta. Um, so the angle is larger on that image to the left, and that means that, that the dislocations are spaced closer together. Now, the reason this is important is because each of those dislocations has some localized strain around it. Um, and so to a first order approximation, the energy of this low angle uh, grain boundary can be approximated by how many dislocations I have per unit area. So the larger the angle is, the larger that surface energy should be, and it should increase linearly, especially over small angles. Um, and we can see that uh, if we look at this. So this is basically the interfacial energy that's plotted as a function of that rotation angle. Um, and at low angle grain boundaries, so these, these grain boundaries that are they're occurring uh, down here, at very small angles, that boundary energy increases linearly until some point. And basically beyond this point, or beyond this point here, we wouldn't really call this a low angle grain boundary anymore. It's, it's gone past that, that limit. So again, at low angles, the grain boundary energy is proportional uh, to the tilt angle because we can accommodate that by um, having some density of edge dislocations. Um, and the larger the tilt angle we need, the, the greater the density of edge dislocations. And so that means a, a greater elastic energy at that interface. So those are low angle um, tilt boundaries. So we're gonna switch from talking about tilt to talking about twist grain boundaries. And again, in general, uh, I describe this, uh, you know, this is a homophase boundary and I would need uh, to describe it as a rotation around two particular axes. Um, but for a twist grain boundary, we only have one component of rotation. And so that's the same as the tilt grain boundary, except we're rotating around a different axis now. And so for a twist grain boundary, picture grabbing onto the left-hand side with respect to the right-hand side, and you're twisting one relative to the other. So the axis of rotation that we're twisting around is a vector that's uh, normal to this, uh, this interface. Um, so again, 
tilt and twist grain boundaries are both sort of subsets of general rotation axes where we're limiting the rotation they can extend around. Um, and so what I'm showing here is basically it's a different perspective of the same case where that top grain is being t uh, twisted relative to the bottom grain. Uh, and the surface that's exposed here is that uh, twist grain boundary interface. So if I look down this axis and I look at the alignment of the atoms on either side of that twist grain boundary, uh, I start to see something like this. Um, and oops, uh, you can kind of see that, you know, based on how much I twist it, and this again is a relatively small twist angle, um, it's going to describe how much, um, you know, how large the regions are that are, you know, lining along each other pretty well um, versus the density of regions that are sort of misaligned. Um, and in fact, what happens is if I twist it and then I allow that to relax, all of that, uh, all of that um, misfit will, will coalesce into certain regions. And this is also a, another defect that we've seen before. So I'm going to give you a second to look at this. Again, we're looking down the interface. And so uh, within these squares, um, you know, they're uh, basically the grain on top is aligned along the grain on bottom. Um, but then near these particular lines, um, all of that uh, misfit has been localized. Um, so I'm hoping that you're starting to see this, but these are actually screw dislocations that are lying in the plane of the, uh, the tilt grain boundary. Um, and so just as before, when we were describing tilt grain boundaries, um, and tilt grain boundaries at low angles can be described by some uh, density of edge dislocations, well, twist grain boundaries at low angles can also be described by some uh, density of screw dislocations. Um, and so uh, same as before, the, the interfacial energy will increase linearly with that angle of rotation because I need a greater density of dislocations at that interface to accommodate that rotation. Um, so uh, this is kind of a final uh, snapshot summary of the difference between these. So again, a, a tilt uh, and a twist grain boundary. Um, the, the tilt is when the axis of rotation is lying in the plane of the grain boundary interface. And the twist grain boundary, the axis of rotation, is coming out of the board here. So it's perpendicular to the grain boundary interface. Pure tilt grain boundaries at low angles can be described uh, as having a bunch of edge dislocations that are accommodating that. And pure twist grain boundaries can be described as having a bunch of screw dislocations that are lying, again, in the plane of that interface. Now, these are useful end members to think about. In the real world, we have a lot of things that are neither pure tilt nor pure twist. Um, but again, if you have some component of tilt and some component of twist, you could picture having a combination of edge and screw dislocations um, that accommodate for that uh, misorientation.